Again, the title of our sermon, The Fruits of Faithfulness, Judges chapter 9, verses 1 through 21. Now, in this period of the judges, we see, we have seen, we will see, a deadly infection that is eating away at Israel from the inside. You know, Israel is put down. By the hand of God, Israel has put down her external enemies. Uh, They have won this great battle against Midian, and that's by the hand of Gideon. But now we see Israel uh, being devoured from the inside out, as it were. This infection eating away at Israel from the inside. There's a spiritual dry rot in the heart that is destroying the nation, uh, plunging each consecutive generation into sin, misery, and judgment. And that spiritual decay, the spiritual gangrene, that spiritual cancer is the bitter fruit of faithlessness. Faithlessness. They're not putting their faith and trust in the Lord. They forget the Lord their God and that spiritual decay is wreaking havoc on the people of Israel. But by God's grace, we remember the account of Gideon. Gideon grew to be a man of faith and that was by God's doing, by God's grace to him, by God's hand. Through Gideon's faith, the Lord delivers his people under the hand of Midian. Uh, Gideon is mentioned in the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, turning to flight the armies of the aliens. And so the Lord blesses the nation of Israel, blesses the people of God through Gideon's faith, through Gideon's obedience to the Lord's word. But now we know from chapter 8 that Gideon's tenure as judge in Israel, doesn't end well. He sows bitter seed in Israel. He pursues bitter fruit in Israel, and his actions have consequences. We read these tragic, sobering words at the end of Judges chapter 8, where it reads, So it was, as soon as Gideon was dead, that the children of Israel then again played the harlot with the Baals and made Baal Barret their God. That's amazing, isn't it? That we're talking about the covenant people of God with God as their Lord, who has delivered them out of the hand of Midian, and here they are again, not even a generation later, playing the harlot with pagan idols. Verse 34, thus the children of Israel did not remember the Lord their God who had delivered them from the hands of all their enemies on every side. This is the fruit of faithlessness. It's the fruit of faithlessness. The text says they did not remember the Lord their God. Now again, that doesn't mean that they forgot who he is, right? Who's the, they, they know who he is. It's not that they forgot that he's there. Or they have forgotten what he has done. It means that they did not acknowledge who he is or what he's done for them in their actions. Uh, He didn't acknowledge him as as having any part of their regular day-to-day lives. They did not like to retain him in their thinking, right? They suppressed the truth of God in their unrighteousness. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. Although they knew God... Paul would say, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they grateful. Romans chapter 1, verse 21. They willfully refused to retain God in their thoughts. Romans chapter 1, verse 28. That's a pretty good indication of exactly what's going on in Israel all these years earlier. And listen, you and I run the same, the very same course when you start and end your day without giving the Lord a second thought, right? The same course today, right? When we, when we live our lives without any consideration of the purpose for which we are to live our lives, right? We talked about it this morning in the sermon that the end of our redemption is the glory of God. We were bought at a price. Therefore, we are to glorify God in our body, in our spirit, which are God's. We belong to him. Uh, We are to retain him in our thinking. We're to remember him. We're to meditate on him, meditate on his word. He is to be the driving force behind all of our thoughts, all of our actions. These did not remember the Lord their God who had delivered them from their enemies. They did not remember the Lord their God who had given them the land. They did, they're living in the land. And they don't remember the Lord their God who gave that land to them. They're dwelling in houses they did not build. Right? Doesn't Moses say that under the law? 
They did not remember the Lord their God who had given them food to eat, a roof over their heads, air to breathe, clothes on their backs. This is the fruit, the bitter fruit of faithlessness. Faithlessness. When you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're committing to follow him. You're saying, I entrust all that I am to all that he is. I'm entrusting myself to him. I am a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm a learning follower. I'm an apprentice, if you will, of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to trust him with my very existence. And that means following him, hearing him, heeding his word. It's a a faithfulness, a devotion, a fidelity to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's faithfulness. Uh, They are not even retaining the Lord their God in their thinking. And this is faithlessness. And when we don't remember him, we bear the bitter fruit of our faithlessness. So what is the fruit of that faithlessness? What's the fruit? Well, as soon as Gideon was dead, the children of Israel again played the harlot with the Baals. It is a slippery, swift slope to apostasy. A life of faithlessness, a life of forgetting the Lord your God will lead to apostasy. It will lead to idolatry. They became futile in their thoughts. Their foolish hearts were darkened. Romans chapter 1 verse 21. Professing to be wise, they became fools and they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image made like corruptible man. Romans chapter 1 verse 23. They exchanged the truth of God for the lie. And listen, when you are not clinging to Christ, in faith, when you're not clinging to his word through faith in Christ, then you are in some form, to some degree, exchanging the truth of God for the lie. What's the lie? I'm secure without him. I'm safe without him. I don't need him. I can live my life for himself. I'll just call upon him when I need him. They exchange the truth of God for the lie. This is the bitter fruit of faithlessness. Therefore, therefore, God gave them up to the fruits of their faithlessness. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 29, wisdom cries aloud to the people. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord... They would have none of my counsel and despised my every rebuke. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their own way and be filled to the full with their own fancies. As someone who is faithless, that sounds pretty good. I'll not have that man to rule over me. I'd like to eat the fruit of my own fancies for a while, they may say. But listen, the proverb says... Because they hated knowledge, they did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would have none of his counsel. They despised his every correction, his every rebuke. And so they shall eat the fruit of their own way. They'll be filled to the full with their own fancies. God will give them over, Romans chapter 1. Gives them over to a debased mind, right? Well, the fruit of their own fancy would be the wicked king of Shechem. (laughs) The son of Gideon and his Shechemite concubine, Abimelech, the bramble king. And the nation now, under Abimelech, has essentially become Canaanized, entirely Canaanized. They've turned to harlotry with the Baals. Now, even a genuine Christian, even a genuine Christian is prone to wander in the flesh, right? Right? To leave the God they love, as the hymn says. In doing so, we face the bitter fruit of our own faithlessness. God doesn't simply, miraculously, rapture you out of circumstances that you have sinned your way into. 
Neglect his wisdom in your own life and you will eat the fruit of your own way. You'll be filled to the full with your own fancies. Uh, Those who put their faith in him, Solomon tells us, dwell safely. Now we'll see throughout our text the ongoing faithfulness of God, his steadfast loving kindness in the face of the faithlessness of his people. And we see the bitter fruit of their faithlessness from three perspectives in our text. First, we have an enemy from within, verses 1 through 6. Second, there's a curse from without, verses 7 through 21. And lastly, a judgment of fire that we'll see next Lord's Day, Lord willing, verses 22 through 57. Now we begin with the enemy from within, verse 1, the rise of Abimelech. Look at verse 1 with me. Then Abimelech, the son of Jerubbaal, went to Shechem to his mother's brothers and spoke with him. This is Abimelech's family, with all the family of the house of his mother's father. And he said this to them, verse 2. Please speak in the hearing of all the men of Shechem. Which is better for you, that all 70 of the sons of Jerubbaal reign over you, or that one reign over you? And listen, while you're thinking about it, remember that I am your own flesh and bone. Now Israel... Israel's not dealing now with Midian. They're not dealing with Moab or Ammon. They're dealing with enemy, an enemy that is now far closer to home. This is one, frankly, of their own, Abimelech, the son of Gideon and his Shechemite concubine. The son with the name meaning my father is king now plans to carve out a kingdom for himself. Right? He's going to carve out a kingdom of his own making within the borders of Israel. Abimelech wants to be king, and he wants to be king of Shechem. So, the highly ambitious now, the highly treacherous Abimelech goes to Shechem. We'll see how treacherous he is as he hatches this plan to snatch a kingdom for himself in Shechem. This will be no easy task Right? He's got to be crafty about this. He's got to be shrewd. He must carefully plan his wickedness. First, he has to deal with family on his mother's side that live in Shechem. Secondly, he then has to deal with family on his father's side. And again, this is Abimelech not giving any creed whatsoever to the word of God, not considering the Lord at all in this. This is strictly his personal ambition, his personal goal, his personal aim, his personal agenda. And he, in doing all of this, he's going to have to leverage one against the other. He's going to have to leverage family on his mother's side against family on his father's side. And he'll have to exploit the both of them for his own advantage. And you know what? Abimelech says to himself, yeah, that's worth it, right? Like the, the, the thought of all the wickedness that has to be piled up in consecutive order for Abimelech to pull this off doesn't even really cross his mind, right? He's hatching the plan. He doesn't stop to think about the level of wickedness. And people can get that way, right? They see something before them that they want And they grasp for it without thinking of what it takes to get it, who they have to betray, how many lies they have to tell, what they have to sacrifice in order to get the thing that they want. That's the textbook definition of covetousness, which Paul says is idolatry. Now, Abimelech says to his relatives on his mother's side, you know, take this down, guys. I'm going to dictate a message to you. I want you to write it down. And he dictates to them exactly what they're to say to all the men of Shechem. Now, men here, the men of Shechem, literally means landowners, lords and masters. These are leaders in Shechem, men with influence in Shechem. In other words, he goes straight to those people who have a vested interest in what happens. And he doesn't go himself What does he do? He tells his family who live there, they know these men, and he sends his family, his brothers, as spokesmen for him. Again, pretty shrewd here by Abimelech. These people, these lords, masters, landowners, leaders in Shechem have a lot to lose, so he appeals to them based entirely upon their own personal self-interest. Listen, he says to them, what's going to go better for you? Right, The 70 sons of Gideon? ruling over you, and listen, you don't know what you're going to get, there's 70 of them, or me, one ruler, you know I'm your, from your family, I'm your own flesh, your own bone, 
right? He appeals to them on the fact that one is better than many, and your own blood better than a stranger. Verse 3, And his mother's brothers spoke all these words concerning him in the hearing of all the men of Shechem, and their heart was inclined to follow Abimelech, for, he said, for they said, he is our brother. Wow. You can chalk one up to Abimelech. First success. He successfully dealt with his mother's side of the family. The men of Shechem have agreed that they would bring about the rule of Abimelech in Shechem. Now, what's the second step in this master plan that he's hatched? He has to put down any threat to his rule by dealing with his father's side of the family. He has to deal with his brothers. And this will be so much worse <laughs> a way that Abimelech decides to do that. And listen, by this point, people in Shechem uh, know the plan. Abimelech's lust, Abimelech's covetousness, his idolatry knows no bounds here. So verse 4, they gave him 70 shekels of silver from the temple of baal Barret, with which Abimelech hired worthless and reckless men, and they followed him. They gave Abimelech one shekel, one shekel for every brother he would have to murder in order to bring about his wicked, self-absorbed, selfish, self-interested plan. You think about that for a moment, right? Look how cheap, how valueless, how worthless even the lives of other people are held in your esteem when they stand in your face or stand in the way of what you want. Listen, uh, we may look at a story like this and say, well, this is over the top, right? Over the top that Abimelech would act this way. But we have to be really honest with ourselves that apart from the work of God's spirit within us, apart from the redeeming work of the Lord Jesus Christ, apart from faith, apart from God working in us and through us for his, his good pleasure, there but by the grace of God go I. <laughs> The seeds of this kind of self-absorbed, self-interested selfishness exists within us. Abimelech says, this is what I want, and to hell with you if you stand in my way. It's essentially what Abimelech is saying. It's amazing, isn't it? Family, honor, love, integrity, care, compassion, none of it matters. This is the heart of a selfish person. Selfishness. Now they paid the price, 70 shekels of silver. What a, you know, the, the, the price of a female slave, I think it was 30 shekels of silver. The price of a male slave in Israel was 50 shekels of silver. One female slave, 30 shekels. One male slave, 50 shekels. And here's 70 shekels for the death, the murder of the 70 sons of Gideon. From the temple coffers of Baal Barret. Baal Barret there meaning is, is the word meaning the temple of those in covenant with Baal. They have a covenant with Baal. They're not covenanted here with the Lord their God. They're covenanted with Baal. And Abimelech hires worthless. Literally the word worthless there is, it means empty. Now in one sense it means without value. These guys are worthless scallywags, right? <laughs> Worthless men. But likely also means stupid. They're empty, <laughs> empty-headed, worthless, and reckless men. And these stupid and reckless men, they follow Abimelech. That's interesting. <laughs> interesting to think about how you can always find a group of this sort together. <laughs> like birds of a feather, Right? Um, filthy water gathering at the lowest point. It always seems like a group like this finds one another. Uh, I'm weak. I'm faithless. I'm not really interested in following the Lord. I'm just going to mm, pretend over here in the corner. And what ends up happening? Someone else who's faithless, weak, and not really finding the Lord gravitates 
weaves their way through a crowd and somehow finds that one and they become best buddies and they begin to hang out together. And then another one comes and another, and pretty soon you've got a clique, people hanging out who aren't really following the Lord. They're not concerned with taking a stand for righteousness. Uh, they're just, they just become a little social clique within the Lord's church, within the camp. Filthy water gathering at the lowest point. Listen, if you don't want to be like them, get out of their group. <laughs> if you find yourself in the company of people that are not strengthening you, people that are not uh, holding you accountable, people that are not charging you to pursue righteousness, pursue holiness, pursue the Lord, people that are not by their very pursuit of righteousness encouraging you to pursue righteousness, then don't hang out with that guy. Don't spend time with that young lady. Get out of their group. And when you get out of their group, they may speak evil of you because that's what people like this do. They think it's strange that you don't run with them in the same flood of dissipation in which they are running. But listen, you don't want to be empty. You don't want to be stupid. You don't want to be reckless. You don't want to be worthless. You don't want to be ungodly. So if you don't want to be influenced that way, Get out of that group. You need to spend your time with people who are fervently and faithfully serving the Lord. Mature brothers and sisters who can help you grow. Spend your time with genuine Christians who love the Lord. Let them influence you. Bad company, Paul says, corrupts good morals. There's nowhere in the Bible that flips that around. <laughs> Bad company corrupts good morals. You know, we need another Proverbs 1 reference. Let's, let's listen to another one. Proverbs 1, verse 10. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie in wait to shed blood. Let us lurk secretly for the innocent without cause. This is exactly what Abimelech is saying to his worthless, reckless, stupid buddies. Let us lurk secretly for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them alive like Sheol and whole like those who go down into the pit. We shall find all kinds of precious possessions. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in your lot among us. Let us all have one purse. <laughs> How long is that going to last? My son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your foot from their path. For their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird, but they lie in wait for their own blood. They lurk secretly for their own lives, and they don't know it. So are the ways of everyone who is greedy for gain. It takes away the life of its owners. Bad company ruins good morals. And listen, you'll lose your life. You'll lose your life. You may become apostate. Now we all think we're all pretty self-confident sometimes when it comes to these things. Nah, it's not going to happen to me. There, but by the grace of God go I. Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he falls. He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. That's wisdom from the Bible. Now let's make good application here in thinking about these things and thinking about these worthless buddies of Abimelech. It's not likely that you may fall in with murderers and thugs in our day. Although, although there have been some who have fallen in with murderers and thugs when they depart the living God. The people today will set out to destroy your character. They may not destroy your possessions or destroy your life, but they'll certainly do whatever they can to destroy your character. Remember the prophet Jeremiah. This is essentially what happened to Jeremiah. When Jeremiah takes a stand for righteousness, what happens to Jeremiah? Jeremiah chapter 18, God said to Jeremiah, speak to the men of Judah, Jeremiah, return now everyone from his evil way. Jeremiah is taking a stand for righteousness. Make your ways and your doings good. So, what do, the, what do the empty, worthless, reckless people say in response to Jeremiah? They say, Jeremiah 18, that is hopeless, they say. 
faithlessness. Do you see? Entirely faithless. That's hopeless. So we will walk according to our own plans. We will, everyone, obey the dictates of his own evil heart. And so they said to themselves, come, let us devise plans against Jeremiah. For the law shall not perish from the priest, nor the counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophet. Nothing bad is going to happen here. Come, let us attack him with the tongue, and let us not give heed to any of his words. What do they do? Rather than following the Lord, rather than trusting the Lord, rather than loving their brother, rather, rather than heeding the word of God, rather than pursuing righteousness, rather than standing for holiness, they attack Jeremiah. They attempt to destroy his character with their tongue and they refused to heed any of his words. And Jeremiah said that they dug a pit for his life when in reality, Proverbs chapter 1, they dig a pit for their own, right? They dig a pit for their own. It takes away the life of its owners. There's usually and Abimelech that will lead this godless effort. We've seen many Abimelechs, haven't we, in our day? But there always seem to be a bunch of empty-headed, stupid, worthless, reckless people that follow after that Abimelech. And what happens when they follow after that guy? They themselves eat the fruit of their own fancy, filled to the brim with the fruit of their own way. Don't let your guard down and go running with those who do and say such things. Choose this day whom you will serve. I've often said to people before, you've got to make decisions like this when you're clear-headed, when you're thinking right, your head is screwed on right, you're thinking clearly, make decisions about what you will and will not do. Make decisions about who you will allow and who you will not allow to influence you. Choose love, choose grace, choose mercy, choose gratitude, choose faithfulness, choose holiness, choose righteousness. Abimelech and his band simply do not. They choose their own way. They dig a pit for their own life. So what does Abimelech do with his dumb band of brothers? Verse 5, he goes to his father's house at Ophrah and killed his brothers, the 70 sons of Jeroboam on one stone. But Jotham, the youngest son of Jeroboam, was left because he hid himself. Boy, that's a fateful occurrence. <laughs> Isn't that a coincidence that he hid? No, this is the work of God. God hid one son of the 70 of Jeroboam. He hid him. Verse 6, And all the men of Shechem gathered together, all of Beth Milo, and they went and made Abimelech king beside the terebinth tree at the pillar that was in Shechem, that pagan pillar. They killed all of the brothers except one, and all on one stone, which means all on one chopping block, right? All on one chopping block. Now, if you think about that for a moment, it means they didn't go into battle. They didn't slay them with a sword in a big fight, you know, going around and all the men fighting, and they slayed them with a sword that way. No, nope. It means that they rounded them up one by one. It means they bound them one by one and they took them one by one to the stone and they murdered each one one at a time on the stone. That's what that means. This was a calculated, cold, brutal, heartless, soulless act of wickedness something that empty men may often do with their words. You see, the same seed, the seed of that depraved act, wicked men often do with their own words. They wouldn't get away with murdering you in our day like that. This is a wicked, calculated, heartless, loveless act on the part of Abimelech and his worthless buddies. This all took place with the approval of the men at Shechem. 
then they made Abimelech king. It's amazing, isn't it? Incidentally, and interestingly, the place where the inheritance generation of Israelites under Joshua gathered together and presented themselves before God to make a vow and an oath to follow the Lord God of Israel, they renewed the covenant in Shechem. This is the same place. Look quickly at Joshua. Joshua chapter 24, a few pages back to the left. Joshua 24, look there beginning at verse 1. Same place, verse 1. And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem. Here it is. And called for the elders of Israel, for their heads, for their judges, for their officers. And they presented themselves before God. Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor, dwelt on the other side of the river in old times, and they served other gods. Then I took, look at what the Lord God does, right? How gracious, how good. Then I took your father Abraham from the other side of the river, led him throughout all the land of Canaan, multiplied his descendants, and gave him Isaac, all with steadfast faithfulness to the covenant that he had made with Abraham, right? God keeping his word. Uh, He begins in this to recount the goodness, the covenant keeping love, the covenant keeping faithfulness of God. He says in verse 4, to Isaac, I gave Jacob and Esau. To Esau, I gave the mountains of Seir to possess, but Jacob and his children went down to Egypt. Also, I sent Moses and Aaron And I plagued Egypt according to what I did among them. Afterward, I brought you out. Right? I am the Lord your God who delivered you out of the hand of Egypt. Right? Amazing faithfulness, amazing love. He continues in verse 14. Now therefore, fear the Lord and listen. Serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. Well, the people there at Shechem in Joshua 24 took a vow to serve the Lord. Joshua in Shechem even set up a memorial stone as a witness to their oath. So that when they denied the Lord, that memorial stone would witness against them. There's a stone in Shechem to this very day in Judges chapter 9 that is a witness to that oath. The bones of Joseph were brought out of Egypt and buried there at Shechem. Remember, Joseph made them promise that they would do that. So there's a lot of history with God, the covenant-keeping God of Israel, Yahweh. There's a lot of history with God in that town, in Shechem. They may not have retained God in their thinking, but they knew who the Lord was. They knew what the Lord had done for them. They knew what the Lord expected of them. They have a memorial stone set up in Shechem. They knew the vow that that inheritance generation made there in that city. And yet the children of Israel, it is said of them that they did not remember the Lord their God. Amazing, right? This self-willed forgetfulness. And now, think of it, now Shechem is the center of Baal worship and home to a usurper king. Israel has become Canaanized. Many, many disregard their past. They forget what the Lord has done for them. They ignore what the Lord has done for them. They they neglect all the good that the Lord has shown to them. It's amazing to me. Uh, We've known many for whatever reason, one reason or another, have left this church or left good, sound theology, left brothers and sisters who uh, labored to love them and disciple them and instruct them and correct them and encourage them and love them some more. Right? They left, leave all that and they go off to who knows where. And then you hear later on that, oh, you know, 
they've become entirely apostate or they're no longer serving the Lord anymore. They're no longer going to a church. They've been out for four years and they still haven't found a church to go to. They, you know, sit in their living room and watch some service on TV on Sunday morning. Um, oh, you're not here that they're a modalist now or they're, they've um, uh, plunged themselves into charismania. They've become a charismatic, right? It just happens all the time and we somehow think in our pride that it can't happen to us we need God's word we need God's people we need God's spirit we need to hold fast to faithfulness we need this and they are eating the fruit of their own way filled to the full with their own fancy the bitter fruit of their faithlessness my, how far Israel now has fallen. Once those who profess to know the Lord, once they willfully turn from him, once they return to their own vomit, return to living for themselves, their own agenda, that slippery pathway always leads to more and more degeneracy and depravity. There must be repentance before it's too late. There must be a return to your first love, uh, it must be repentance. Well, Abimel Abimelech and his brainless buddies, they missed one. They didn't get all 70. And this one would become a spokesperson for the Lord. Verse 5, Jotham, the youngest son of Jeroboam, was left because he hid himself. God's word will not be silenced. <laughs> God preserves for himself a witness for their good, for his glory. When they told Jotham that Abimelech had been made king of Shechem, verse 7, he went and stood on top of Mount Gerizim, and he lifted his voice and he cried out. Now, if you remember from Deuteronomy 27, Gerizim and Ebal were the mountains of blessing and cursing, right? Split up Israel, put half on Mount Gerizim, half on Mount Ebal. Um, they would cry out across the valley, blessings and cursing. Gerizim was the mountain of blessing, it's interesting that Jotham went there. They stood on Mount Gerizim to bless the people. So Jotham takes a deep breath. He's on Mount Gerizim, the Mount of Blessing. And he uses his best open-air preaching voice. And he said to them, Listen to me, you men of Shechem, that God may listen to you. That God may listen to you. In other words, from the Mountain of Blessing, Jotham calls them to repentance. There's time for repentance. There's time for blessing. It's not too late to turn back to the Lord. This is the Lord calling them to consider their ways. God is faithful even when we are faithless. God is so faithful to do this. He'll remember his covenant. Even when you forget him, turn to him in repentance and faith. Right? This is the patience of God. God could have sent Jotham to Mount Ebal, to the Mount of Cursing, pronounced judgment upon them, and then rained down fire from heaven. God doesn't do that. He sends him to Mount Gerizim and pronounces or proclaims the word of God, calls them to repentance. So Jotham tells them a fable. Verse 8. The trees once went forth to anoint a king over them. They said to the olive tree, reign over us. The olive tree said to them, should I cease giving my oil with which they honor God and men and go sway over trees? So all the trees then said to the fig tree, you come and reign over us, fig tree. The fig tree said to them, should I cease my sweetness, my good fruit, to go and sway over trees? So the trees then went to the vine and said, you come and reign over us. But the vine said to them, should I cease my new wine, which cheers both God and men, and go sway over trees? Strike three, right? So they go to then, all the trees, to the bramble, verse 14, and said to the bramble, you come and reign over us. The bramble said to the trees, if in truth you anoint me as king over you, then come, take shelter in my shade. But if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. These cedars of Lebanon were these massive, majestic trees. And the fire that comes out of this bramble would consume all the trees, even these giant, majestic cedars of Lebanon. So the trees have decided that they need a king to rule over them. Trees go to three particular trees who happen to be wise, sensible trees. 
the olive, the fig, and the vine. And the trees ask them to reign over them. But each of these surprisingly wise trees are entirely content with their proper purpose. They're content with what they are supposed to do. They have a certain usefulness to fulfill in the order of things. They embrace their role that they've been given as trees. They don't seek to be exalted. They seek to fulfill their calling that they've been given as trees. So they're not selfish. They're not self-absorbed. They're not pridefully ambitious. They're not covetous. They are content. Do you see how contentment leads to wisdom? Contentment leads to uh, you embracing your role and... uh, in the Lord, rejoicing in that role. But there's a fourth so-called tree, a selfish, self-absorbed, pridefully ambitious, self-involved bramble. Now, a bramble is worthless, absolutely worthless. A bram- bramble produces no shade, and yet he says to the other trees, come and you know, take shelter in my shade. A bramble produces absolutely no fruit, A a bramble is a result of the fall. (laughs) It's thorns and thistles you will bring forth for me, the curse says. A bramble is like a thorn bush, a briar. Absolutely nothing whatsoever to contribute. In fact, a bramble is simply known for nothing else but blowing around in the wind, catching fire, and burning stuff down. That's all a bramble does. It sounds entirely like Abimelech, a worthless usurper king. Abimelech even levels a curse against them in his pride if they aren't subject to him. If you don't anoint me as king over you, then let fire come out of the bramble, right? So Jotham then interprets the story for them, verse 16. Now therefore, listen to this. If you have acted in truth and sincerity. Does that sound familiar? Where have we heard that before? We heard that in the covenant renewal ceremony with Joshua and the children of Israel at Shechem, when they made a vow to serve the Lord, serve the Lord in truth and sincerity. If you've acted in truth and sincerity in making Abimelech king, and if you've dealt with Jeroboam in his house and have done to him as he deserves, for my father fought for you. He risked his life and delivered you out of the hand of Midian, but you have risen up against my father's house this day, killed his 70 sons on one stone, and made Abimelech, the son of his female servant, king over the men of Shechem, because he's your brother. If then you have acted, here it is again, in truth and sincerity with Jeroboam and with his house this day, then rejoice in Abimelech. Let him also rejoice in you. But if not, and they know they haven't, <laughs> Then let fire come from Abimelech and devour the men of Shechem and Beth Milo. And let fire come from the men of Shechem and from Beth Milo and devour devour Abimelech. Let them destroy themselves. Jotham ran away and fled. He went to Beer, dwelt there for fear of Abimelech, his brother. There was no standing in the back of the church shaking hands after service, right? He bolted. Because he feared Abimelech, his brother. In truth and in sincerity. Fear the Lord. Serve him in sincerity and in truth. Put away your idols. We'll see in the rest of the chapter how this ultimatum comes to pass. But first, I can't help but uh, to notice here the parallels between Abimelech and most of those who seize power for themselves in our own day. If you think about that and meditate on the text, you see the fruit of this, this bitter fruit of faithlessness, you see it in our own politics today, and it's worth mentioning for that reason. Many in power today pursue power for ungodly personal gain for their own ambition. They're often prideful. They're often narcissistic, disguising self-service in a cloak of serving others or in serving country or in serving the community. When in, in reality, they are serving themselves. Often thieves and derelicts that thirst after the praise of men and not the praise of God. 
And in order to ascend to power, they're, in their minds, forced to lie and make promises that they can't keep. It's become axiomatic of politicians today that they don't keep their promises. Is a politician's mouth moving? That means he's lying, right? It's like, um, I don't mean to say that that is every one of them, but that is a common experience today in our own politics. They are Abimelech. And the Shechemites are only too willing to put them into power. The church is to be salt and light to this government, right? We're to, through the proclamation of the gospel, call to light these ungodly usurpers and their ungodly ways. God puts governments in place, but God intends governments to rule with justice, in truth, and in sincerity. Like John the Baptist in Luke chapter 3, verse 19, John the Baptist stood against Herod. He rebuked Herod for um, Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the other evils, it says there, that Herod, Herod had done. And with that, we have that example for the church. The church should be an outspoken rebuke, an outspoken correction to the evils that we see in our government. Now, we honor the governing authorities. We should pray for them. We should obey the governing authorities. The, the scriptures are very clear. And we should care for them and pray for those in authority over us. But we, as the church, must take a stand for righteousness when we have opportunity to take a stand for righteousness. And we can't merely be meek and mild and dripping with hand lotion, right? It's like a, it requires that we take a stand for righteousness. There will come a point in time, it's already, it's already beginning to happen. It's already beginning to happen where the governments of this world, our government, government in particular, those in charge will labor with all of the power that they have with them by virtue of their office. They will labor to drive Christians into the darkness, drive Christians into the confines of the four walls of the church. They will drive Christian conversation. They will drive the proclamation of the gospel inside. We must take a stand for righteousness. We must obey God rather than men. We must take a stand when government encroaches past its God-given authority as we see even now in our circumstances that happening to some degree or another. But the Lord, rich in mercy, abounding in grace, the Lord kept a son hidden. I love that. He kept a son hidden for this reason, for the proclamation of the gospel. He will cast down, the Lord will cast down all Abimelechs and he will cast down all of their kingdoms. Revelation chapter 11, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms, kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. The enemy thought that he had killed him, thought that he had got them all, Time and time and time and time and time again he tried, but he couldn't. Until, until when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth that son to preach from the mount of blessing, repentance from sin, and faith in the one who saves sinners. There's a curse if you do not. Anyone who does not abide in him, he is cast out as a branch and is withered and the reapers gather those dry withered fruitless bramble branches and throw them into the fire and they are burned it's the bitter fruit of faithlessness a praise God for the provision in Christ that he's made for our sin if we will put our faith and trust in him amen, amen. let's pray father in heaven thank you for your word Thank you for these lessons that you've taught us. Thank you, Lord, for loving us in Christ. 
Thank you, Lord, for the provision that you've made for our sin. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for the sacrifice of your own life, uh, the shedding of your own blood on Calvary for sinners. Thank you for making atonement for us. Thank you for redeeming us. Thank you, Lord, that it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, by his righteousness, we can be saved and declared righteous, forgiven of our sin, justified, and stand before God in the presence of God. We love you. We thank you for this glorious salvation. Lord, help us by your spirit to live faithfully for you. Help us to cling to you, heeding the warnings given here of Abimelech and his faithless buddies. We thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank <laughs> you.